some of the names that I see in the participant list. Hello. Um, before I start, I, I, sh I had to shut off my video because as I was telling the, the panelists, living a full 15 miles from one of the biggest research institutions in the country means I have very poor internet <laughs> access and you were all starting to sound drunk as I was listening to you. And so, sorry about that. Um, today's speakers are Susanna Roque Malo and Jennifer Druhan, both from the U University of Illinois. I'm gonna I'm going to introduce both of them now, and then they're gonna pass off the presentation between them. Um, Susanna, I know personally because she participated in our 2018 Critical Zone and Ecosystem Dynamics Summer School in. Grand Paradiso National Park in Italy. It was a great experience and I, I got to uh, enjoy her company. She's a PhD candidate with Praveen Kumar at the University of Illinois. And I'm really looking forward to hearing about how your work has evolved. Jenny Druhan, I've met a couple times, but I can't say I know her well, is a assistant professor. And Jenny, I should have asked you this, but I got confused when I went to the website I think you're in the Department of Geology, but it also says something about civil and environmental engineering. Yeah, I just hang out with them so much they gave me a title. Ah, okay. But also at the University of Illinois, she got her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and her research focuses on geochemistry and hydrogeology, um, a lot to do with reactive transport, including modeling and stable isotope fractionations. And I think we'll hear some of that today. And so with that, I'm gonna hand it off to Susanna and also encourage the rest of you to ask questions at the end, pose them in the interim if you'd like through the chat, and also stay tuned for some of the upcoming presentations in the series next month. Susanna. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, so, hi everybody. Thank you for for joining. I'm excited today to to talk about um, some of the uh, collaborative work that Jenny and I have been working on. Uh, so, today's talk uh, is going to take the form of first. First off, I'll, I'll go over some general terms and kind of uh, define the scope of the uh, uh, research area that we're interested in. Um, to make sure we're all on the same page. And then uh, I'm gonna get into uh, a, the recent development of a root exudation model, uh, which to my knowledge is the, the first forward predictive model of its kind. And I'll give an example of the application of this type of root exudation modeling uh, for the IML, the Intensively Managed Landscape Critical Zone Observatory, CZL. And then we're going to uh, shift the presentation to a totally different ecosystem and look at another um, application of root exudation modeling. Uh, so Jenny will, will take over at that part. And, and that investigation uh, in the Eel River CZO, the ERCZO, led to the, the recent development of a coupled root exudation and reactive transport modeling framework that we're really excited about. There's some really um, interesting applications for, for this work. So um, before I go any further, let's all get on the same page. If you've never heard the term root exudation, uh, root exudation is the process by which plant roots release organic compounds, either low molecular weight ca uh, carbon compounds like uh, proteins, organic acids, carbohydrates, or high molecular weight carbon compounds like metals into the soil to influence and optimize their uh, immediate environment. Uh, so this is a, an important process by which um, plants connect the above ground world, so force, atmospheric forcings and uh, above ground plant growth to the below ground world. And through root exudation, uh, plants can change their physical um, environment through processes like mineral weathering, uh, and they can control uh, 
the structure and function of microbial communities in the soil. And so that feedback, governing that root and microbe feedback loop uh, is what leads to, to important carbon and nutrient uh, cycling in the soil uh, and uh, is linked to uh, carbon and nutrient cycles at a large scale, a much larger scale than just looking at the root zone. So this is a, a, a pretty complicated process that uh, is at the center of a lot of different biogeochemical processes happening at a larger scale. So um, when we consider it in the context of the critical zone, the bedrock to canopy, uh, canopy top uh, living layer of Earth's crust, when we see where does this uh, really fit in, when we study the critical zone, whether we're looking at natural ecosystems or an ecosystem like what we would have here at the University of Illinois, an intensively managed landscape uh, ecosystem where anthropogenic activity controls a lot of the uh, energy and, and nutrient processes that we can that we see, um, root exudation kind of falls, you can imagine it kind of falls at the center of, of these processes. Um, we're interested in the critical zone of uh, studying those overlapping spaces between water, rock, and life. And so if we kind of zoom in on this section of the critical zone, uh, we see that in this zone, roots can manipulate and, and influence their immediate environment. The uh, entire microcosm of micro microbes and fungi respond uh, to that manipulation, to that influence, and uh, adapt uh, in a symbiotic way, that feedback then impacts carbon, nutrient, and mineral uh, storage and, and transport in the critical zone. And at a larger scale, those, those feedbacks uh, can influence the formation of soil in the deep regolith or the uh, transformation of the, the water, uh, of the chemistry of the water that passes through this zone. So, um, we want to focus on this shallow subsurface within the, the, the critical zone um, framework where rock becomes soil and water becomes groundwater or uh, stream uh, or, or moves out to a stream. And so we, we call this zone where, where all this activity is happening the active root zone. So the active root zone, we, we specify this term because it's, it's different from what is traditionally considered the rhizosphere. The rhizosphere is the, the two centimeter uh, wide section of soil that immediately surrounds the roots. And what we're interested in, in, in studying root exudation and its effects at a larger scale, we want to include that soil that is influenced by uh, the uh, root uh, dynamics. And so we call this the active root zone. So we can start for any, uh, for any ecosystem, we can define this. We can start defining the soil types uh, and their properties, such as the porosity and soil organic matter content. We can define uh, fast and slow uh, carbon pools and include the effects of uh, bio bioturbation or uh, litter and humus formation. We can identify biotic actors in this zone, such as the presence of roots themselves, which may take on a uh, PDF uh, dis distribution in the soil. Uh, or we can consider the, the microbes themselves, which are responsible for facilitating important uh, transformative processes like decomposition and nitrification. Now, this zone is influenced by the hydrologic uh, flows, including the um, flows through the soil matrix or along preferential pathways formed by the roots themselves, uh, or moisture, uh, moisture movement can come in the form of root facilitated hydraulic redistribution. Now, importantly, when we're thinking about this zone and how it, it links to the rest of the, the rest of the critical zone, the active root zone is a, a zone of convergence for important bidirectional forcings. So it's subject to these top-down inputs, which can be from anthropogenic or natural forces, uh, uh, forcings. So 
This can include precipitation and changes in precipitation, uh, fertilizer input, tillage. Uh, these are things that tend to, uh, processes that tend to happen over a shorter time scale. And so these top-down inputs converge in this zone with these longer time scale bottom-up inputs uh, that can come in the form of the replenishment of fresh material uh, from weathering. So what, what we argue is when we're thinking about this in, in terms of, of the, the critical zone biogeochemistry, what's missing from this, uh, this picture that uh, y'all are looking at is the active role of roots in driving these processes in responding to the uh, biogeochemical environment and then uh, influencing it with root exudation. So it, there's a lot going on in this area. There's a lot, there's a, we're able to, with many different types of measurements, capture um, the different states in here. But when you consider the disparate time scales that all these different processes are occurring and all the different moving parts, numerical modeling is a beautiful tool that we can use uh, to study this, this area. And so you might ask, if I've convinced you so far that root exudation is a really important process in critical zone biogeochemistry, you might ask, okay, why isn't it uh, incorporated into more models already? And the, the answer to that is twofold. First of all, when you consider uh, modeling that uh, up until now, it's persisted in a re relatively fragmented form. So uh, either eco-hydrologic models or, or larger scale models consider, cr uh, crudely represent roots or consider them as non-dynamic factors in, uh, in these biogeochemical processes, or at the other end of the uh, spectrum, uh, root architecture models focus on root behavior in detail. And so there's kind of a gap at when we're considering uh, root functions as a, as a part of this uh, uh, whole. And the second part of it is the, the experimental side. Uh, there's no, no arguing that it's extremely challenging to measure the rhizosphere. And so the high resolution data that may be necessary to um, validate these, this type of model uh, may not be readily available. Now, Knowing these, these challenges and seeing this gap in our, our modeling, uh, an opportunity to fill this gap, we felt like our, our group was uh, poised to take on this challenge. And so I'm going to present to you today the, uh, the model called ROOT, uh, which stands for Root Exudation in Watershed Scale Transport. Now, this is an explicit biogeochemical transport model that describes the active input of plant roots uh, uh, inputting signals, basically signaling to the active root zone, uh, which influences my, uh, the microbial population and their function, and that feeds back to the plant itself. And so this model that describes this root microbe interaction in a spatially heterogeneous um, format, as I mentioned before, to my knowledge, is the first forward predictive model of its kind. Uh, so I'll get into, well, yeah, let me, let me first describe. First of all, if, based on what I've just told you, to, to understand this feedback between uh, roots and microbes on their own in a, in a vacuum would not be uh, useful. We want to understand this in the context of uh, above ground forcing changes in how changes in energy and atmospheric inputs will, will impact this, how hydrologic fluxes uh, and changes in uh, nutri nutrient cycling will affect this process. And uh, here at uh, Illinois, there, we have developed MLCAN and a carbon nitrogen nutrient model, which had addressed these gaps already. Uh, so as I mentioned, we felt uniquely poised to take on this challenge. And I'll, I'll describe now how root will fit into this larger um, eco-hydrologic modeling framework. So we start with uh, MLCAN, the multi-layer canopy model, which resolves the um, radiative environmental and thermal regimes of C3 and C4 plants, and it does so in the canopy system and in the root and soil system. Uh, 
So ML can, first off, gives us this ecohydrologic framework that links the above and below ground uh, processes. And the important outputs from this model are the simulation of uh, plant water uptake and hydraulic redistribution, as well as uh, simulations of soil moisture uh, and soil temperature below ground. And so those outputs drive the carbon and nitrogen nutrient model, which uh, models three carbon pools, the fast, slow, and microbial carbon pools. And this carbon and nitrogen nutrient model brings in the um, sort of the passive role of plants in, in driving this below ground biogeochemical cycling by um, incorporating litter fall and plant residue inputs, as well as uh, plant uptake of nutrients like, uh, like nitrogen. And what this, what this model gives us, however, what we're taking away from it for root is the simulation of the microbial, um, microbial uh, excuse me, soil microbes and the uh, states of different nutrients in the soil. And so we build onto this already coupled uh, framework and bring in the active role of, of plants in driving this nutrient cycling below ground. And uh, so what this outputs is first off the uh, updated, so the, the changes to the microbial population and changes to their, the microbes functions, which are directly caused by root exudation. So we're trying to model that, that communication that's happening below ground. Um, so the governing equations that, that we have describe the transport of root exudates and then their feedback to the, the microbial biomass and, act, uh, and its activity. Now, I mentioned before that there are many, many different types of, of root exudates. So we started with, with two, uh, one essential and one non-essential. We first started with glucose, which is a sugar, and it acts as the fuel for microbes. It feeds them directly. So we, we can expect that releasing glucose into uh, a soil system will grow that microbial population. Flavonoids, on the other hand, are considered biological nitrification inhibitors, meaning that they slow the microbial activity uh, and slow their ability to, um, uh, to carry out nitrification in the soil. So, and the, that, we say that that's non-essential because it's, uh, flavonoids are only released under certain conditions in the soil. So that's a, a trigger, that's a response that the, the plant has. So our governing equations take the form of a uh, a transport equation where we're looking at, I don't know if y'all can see my, my pointer, but uh, we're looking here at uh, the change in concentration of glucose over time. And so we advect and diffuse that concentration of glucose in the, the one-dimensional uh, soil profile. Uh, and then we uh, add in a concentration in, in, in the form of some source and deplete it by some loss. And our source term is a first order function of the rate of exudation, which we find in literature, and of the root biomass. The loss term uh, has two parts, and it's a, it's a function of uh, microbial consumption rate, which again is something that uh, we find in literature, and the pl uh, plant uptake, which is a function of that uh, water reuptake that uh, that is a forcing from ML can. Now that the governing equation for, for uh, flavonoids takes on a similar form. We advect and diffuse it through the soil uh, column uh, and then replenish, the so replenish with some source and deplete with some loss. And again, in this case, this, the only source of flavonoids in the soil is going to be from exudation. Uh, which is a first order function of ex exudation rate and the root biomass. And the loss, in this case, we don't entirely understand uh, exactly how flavonoids act as biological nitrification inhibitors. And so we use an empirically determined fraction to, to um, determine uh, 
what concentration of flavonoids actually inhibits nitrification and what, what amount stays in the soil. What we do with this lost term for flavonoids then is we convert it into a factor by which we can reduce rates of nitrification. So these, these equations link in with a, a whole suite of uh, other equations of state for nutrients and uh, to describe the rates of these transformative processes. So if we look at the uh, equation for nitrification here, uh, this term that we would have that in the parentheses out front, uh, F lab term is that nitrification in inhibition term. And so that's something that root updates for the uh, carbon and nitrogen nutrient model. The, similarly with the change in microbial biomass, previously the equation had to do with uh, rates of decomposition of litter and humus and uh, biomass death. Uh, but we add this term, this CBDEL, which is the change in microbial biomass directly due to uh, exudation. So let me uh, go ahead and show you some results uh, to demonstrate the utility of this model. So remember that we're looking at the active input of roots to the active root zone. Uh, so that's going to come in the form of exudation of glucose. So what we're looking at in this graph is on the on the y-axis, this is the soil depth going down to 0.6 meters. 98% of the uh, root biomass is contained in the soil layers above 0.6 meters for corn. And on the x-axis, we're looking at the time of planting to 30 days past harvest. And so what we see is that while there is plant, oh, and, and the dotted line that uh, is descending on this graph is the root profile, the root fraction profile for corn. So the red uh, that, that you see in this graph is the, the concentration of glucose that's exuded. So we see that there's more by the surface because there's a larger root biomass there. And we see that after it was day 302 was harvest for this year. We see that that um, glucose concentration in the soil drops off immediately because the, the plant has been harvested. So what's our feedback to uh, the microbes? We're looking uh, here, the feedback we would see is the change in microbial biomass. So we're presenting percent change in microbial biomass here. Where the percent change, we run the model once with no exudation and then we run it with exudation. This percent change is the, the difference between those two simulations. And so we see that while glucose is being uh, released into the soil, we see up to a 4% increase in microbial biomass in the soil. Similarly for flavonoids, I mentioned before that the, these are only released under certain conditions in the soil. So you can, you can see that it, it's a quite a different profile from, from glucose. Uh, but the feedback that we see is the change in uh, rate of nitrification. So we see that anywhere we release flavonoids into the soil, we see a uh, similar pattern in reduction of nitrification. Now, what does this mean to the over, overall feedback to the plant? Uh, well, we see that in the areas of the, the, the days and layers of the soil um, where nitrification was reduced, we see much lower concentrations of nitrate. Um, and similarly, we can, we can start to look at if, if the uh, state of those nutrients in the, the soil profile is um, altered, then we expect that the, the plant uptake of those nutrients will also be altered. So we're, we're seeing here a change in ammonium uptake efficiency. Um, so now overall, when we're, uh, particularly when we're looking at the example uh, in an intensively managed landscape, what, what we started off with was understanding this change in water chemistry. So how do the, the changes in transformations and the, the biogeochemistry in that active root zone, how does that affect what runs off into our surface waters? And so in, in a cornfield, what we're, what we're looking at is uh, 
nitrate is the, the fertilizer, how much fertilizer are we losing? So in this figure, what we're looking at is the relationship between the exud exudation rate and the corresponding reduction in nitrate leaching. So we did a, a uh, sensitivity analysis for, for this model, um, increasing, uh, the, increasing and decreasing the glucose exudation rate and flavonoid exudation rates that we found in, in uh, literature to see if, this, uh, if uh, the results were what we would expect. And so that blue arrow that you see is the flavonoid exudation rate taken from literature. And we see that that's associated with a 14% decrease in nitrate leaching um, in, uh, out of this uh, simulated corn field. And so we see that the solute export from this system uh, or, or our and, uh, predict, the, the solute export from the system that we predict can, can vary greatly when we include the, the role of root exudates uh, in, in driving below ground uh, biogeochemistry. However, this is not, this is just one of many applications of uh, uh, root exudation modeling. And so I'm gonna turn it over now uh, to Jenny, who's gonna talk about a totally different application. Um, while we're switching presentations, Ravindra, did you have a quick question that you wanted to ask Susanna while your hand was raised? Maybe not. Lou, did you have a quick question? Yeah, um, I've spent some time trying to measure some of these uh, kind of organic compounds in soil. And it's really pretty difficult to even get started on it. Most of the results are either laboratory experiments or, or their model results. And I just wondered if you had, you know, what kind of, uh, what kind of testing and benchmarking you've been able to do? I mean, I, never mind flavonoids, even something a little more straightforward um, in terms of, you know, sort of benchmarking the, the model against some observations. Yeah, absolutely. That was, that's a great question. That's something that uh, is one of the major challenges of uh, investigating the um, root processes is there is a lot of uncertainty and there's a lot of difficulty in measuring it. Uh, now, something that came out of the development of root was we saw that the, uh, the order of uh, experimental uh, and modeling iteration doesn't really matter. So we, we can start with a model and use that to inform uh, experimental design to essentially uh, do what you're asking about to, to try to, to uh, zoom in on um, uh, improved measurement in the soil. So that's something that came out of, of the development of ROOT and we've been, uh, we've been collaborating um, with some colleagues uh, designing experimental uh, an experimental setup to measure directly uh, in in situ conditions, some of these exudation rates. So that's something that, uh, as I said, was a, was a result, sort of came out of this uh, model development. But uh, yeah, that's, that is one of the challenges. Great, we'll move on to Jennifer. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Susanna. That was a wonderful context to um, start to think about a different uh, setting for similar processes in terms of understanding how the active root zone actually conveys uh, information. And I suppose we should actually say mass and energy across the a land atmosphere boundary. And so we'll take a step back and we'll take a leap across the country to another of the original um, critical zone observatories. This is the Eel River critical zone, uh, which is located in Northern California. And if you kind of blur your eyes and step way, way back, you're seeing a picture of plants that are rooting into the subsurface. And so in a sense, in a very abstract way, this is not too different from 
the type of setting that Susanna was just talking about. Now, of course, one thing that we begin to recognize immediately is that our length scales are very different. And so in this case, we're looking at this mature uh, dug fir forest where the rooting depth is many meters into the subsurface. And we're sitting along an actively draining hill slope in an area that's uh, uplifting. And so it's a very dynamic setting in which a shale bedrock is getting converted to a shallow soil layer over the course of about 20 meters with a seasonally saturated aquifer sitting above coherent bedrock. That aquifer is always there, but the height of the water table rises and falls. And as many of the uh, principal investigators working at this site have demonstrated in the past, there's seasonal storage of moisture above the water table, but below what you would classify as soil, what Daniela Rempe has been calling rock moisture, that allows this ecosystem to sustain itself through the dry period of this Mediterranean climate. Now, if we were to try and start picking apart the conversion of this shale bedrock into this regolith and ultimately soil, we might start off by looking at the development from a coherent sample up in these rows that were recovered from a core to the top shallow surface. And this is over a length scale now of about 16 meters. And if we were to begin to think about how to quantitatively describe this development or this conversion, the classical uh, approach would be to consider wa water rock interactions and maybe water rock gas interactions in a partially saturated subsurface. And so as we begin to try and develop a simulation framework for this, we might take a typical approach of utilizing samples of this solid phase in laboratory batch experiments to conduct these dissolution that generate these dissolution data sets which produce solute concentrations as a function of time allowing us to parameterize both the equilibria of the minerals in the bedrock as well as the rates at which these solutes are developed and if we want to really do our job we can even go so far as to note that when we begin to apply this same technique of water rock interaction to solid phases that are recovered from different parts of this depth file profile. And again, I'm highlighting the fact that this is over many, many meters rather than centimeters of soil in the previous context. We can see that there are subtle but distinct differences in the generation of solutes, both in terms of their magnitude and their rate when you're dealing with something that's collected from shallower in the subsurface, in other words, a more weathered solid phase versus something that's collected much deeper in the subsurface, closer to what you might consider coherent bedrock. And so with all of this data in hand, we're able to utilize this type of modeling framework to then pivot to the open 1D or even 2D fracture flow system and begin to describe how solutes are generated in the water that's draining through this, these many meters of evolving rock composition. And that would be a very reasonable approach to take in terms of describing the generation of the subsurface weathering profile in this natural setting. That would have been the end of the story and we would be done, except that uh, Daniela had quite an idea and that was to put basically a straw in the ground. We call it the VMS or the Veda Sun Monitoring System. Um, it's basically functions like a set of nested lysimeters, more or less. Uh, we could give you the details on that. But effectively, it's going to allow us to collect fluid samples as they're draining through this weathered uh, bedrock profile through space and time. And the installation is actually not so much at an angle, rather the hill slope itself is at an angle. And so as we pull water from different ports along this set of, of, we'll call them lysimeters for now, we're collecting fluid that's flowed through different path lengths into the subsurface. And so to take that one step further, basically then we're able to take the angle that the VMS is sitting in the subsurface and correct for that drainage path and get a 1D distribution of solute compositions from just beneath the soil to just beneath the water table as that water table moves up and down seasonally. 
So this was a very unique opportunity for us because we were actually finally able to compare those laboratory calibrated reactive transport simulations with real observations of water that's gotten beneath soil that has yet to reach the saturated groundwater, which is really quite a rare chance. Um, and so bravely, we return to the laboratory experiments, and this is the solute compositions that were generated in the lab for a couple select major cations. There's many others that we could look at, and they all nominally do something like this. And when we overlay the composition of solutes that we collect from the fluid that's actually draining through the beta zone in this weathering profile, we find that both the mean and the standard deviation of those solute concentrations are in some cases many orders of magnitude higher than anything that we're able to generate in the lab. And I can tell you from a lot of late nights that you can't explain this for a lot of reasons that you would like to. For example, the difference in the water rock ratio between the batch experiments and the Vedo sum, differences in equilibria as a result of temperature, differences in saturation states. It's, uh, it's, it's a really difficult thing to try and get our heads around, at least initially. And, and in particular, it's troubling and challenging to us because it seems to go against what would be the typical dogma that if you do see discrepancy and discrepancy is common between laboratory and field scale rates, they tend to produce rates in the field that look muted relative to what you can produce in the lab. And this would seem to suggest that we're going the other way. And so, at this point in a rather long story about solutes, I'll bring you back around to these plants. <laughs> in the previous case, we were talking about agricultural ecosystems. And in this case, we're talking about very large trees. But either way, we're rooting into the subsurface and we're driving a nutrient cycle below ground. And thankfully, as a result of the installation of this VMS, we were also able to begin to parse some of those signatures uh, as a function of depth and time through this regolith weathering profile. And here again, I'm gonna draw your attention to the fact that we're looking over many meters now, whereas what Susanna was presenting previously was much more on the 100 centimeters, maybe 200 centimeters tops. And what you're seeing here is the development of a very um, clear production of CO2 many meters below the land surface that is persistent throughout the entire seasonal cycle, regardless of whether this beta zone is fairly wet or fairly dry. You'll also notice that the increase in CO2 is coupled to a decrease in oxygen. I don't have the data on here, but you'll have to believe me that uh, this CO2 is also radiocarbon modern, and I would have lost that bet because I really thought that the only way you could get organic carbon that could be getting oxidized as per the O2 drawdown and producing this CO2 would be some liberation of organic carbon hosted in this shale bedrock, but in fact that's not the case. And so it actually brings us full circle and back to a really interesting new framework to begin to think about applications for root and some of the exudation modeling that Susanna and Praveen have been developing. Uh, in fact, the only way that we can reasonably explain this peak in CO2, this peak in productivity, at about seven or eight meters down is through the introduction of root exudates that are being oxidized in the subsurface, which first of all very clearly highlights the fact that root density is not a direct proxy for root activity. And in fact, this is the same depth interval of the subsurface in which we see a lot of that seasonal cycling of rock moisture. So these are the active root tips that are doing a lot of the uh, let's say perturbation of the subsurface as a result of making the environment hospitable for these trees. And so to bring this all the way around, we're beginning to reconceptualize ways in which we might design models and conceptual um, understanding of how these weathering profiles develop. This is a very recent publication that gives a very nice cartoon synthesis of the way in which we might think about converting bedrock to soil. 
And in this typical framework, we think about picking up carbonic acid as a result of all of this organic carbon oxidation and root related activity in a very shallow layer up above. And then thanks to water, that charged carbonic acid is taken all the way down to this bedrock layer where then weathering takes place. And what we're beginning to recognize in many of these systems is that that spatial segregation is not actually an appropriate framework to be thinking in. In fact, this green circle of carbon cycling and this blue circle of solute cycling are overlapping in these systems. And so the whole idea of soil organic carbon respiration imparting carbonic acid to drive weathering is much more of a merged phenomena in systems that we wouldn't necessarily have anticipated as behaving this way, such as that Doug Fir forest. And so to put this graphically, I think we're, I'm getting very excited about the opportunity to begin to reconceptualize the corn that we work on here in Illinois into a big tree, which in many ways, I think we can argue a lot of the functional relationships are quite similar. In fact, one area that I think would be most distinct between these two models of natural and intensively managed ecosystems is the subsurface. And in particular, the fact that this tree is not only operating over a much deeper length scale in terms of how its active rooting zone is established and where it functions, but also the composition of the soil, well, let's not call it soil, the solid phase that these roots are interacting with. Here we're reaching way down into something that's getting really close to unaltered bedrock. Whereas here we're in the upper tens to hundred centimeter centimeters of a very um, agriculturally engineered soil composition. And so we think that a really exciting development to head in is to begin to utilize the reactive transport capacity like I was demonstrating in some of those more traditional models of regolith weathering with the root driven um, exudation modeling that Susanna's work is allowing us to describe in coupling together root exudation and water rock interaction in an application like the one that I've just shown you. And so I'll hand it back to Susanna to wrap that idea up. Susanna, I think you'll have to take over. Hi all, I'm so sorry, I lost internet connection for a second there. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> Everyone's faces were frozen. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and sorry, I missed the, the handoff there, Jenny. But, uh, but uh, yeah, so, so coming back to uh, the, the root framework, this, this seemed like a uh, this is a really exciting opportunity that we have um, to take advantage of some, some complementary modeling features here. So uh, a model like Root with uh, parameterization and, and customization can uh, handle a completely different ecosystem and a different uh, vegetation species uh, like the trees that, that you would see in uh, the Eel River CZO. But uh, it's it's missing a piece. It's it's specifically missing that feedback uh, to the geochemical uh, that geochemical feedback uh, that incorporates those longer scale weathering processes. And so there's there was a, a beautiful opportunity here to use the the complementary features of root with the um, robust uh, reactive transport model crunch flow. So. What we did considering all these different actors in the system is sort of categorize everything as either translational or transformative. And so the translational processes and, and features are those that are associated with physical heterogeneity. And so that can be uh, having different soil types uh, throughout the soil profile or, yeah, so what did you say, solid, solid phase instead of soil, if we're, we're looking at the, the ERCZO. Uh, also the, the distribution of roots with, with depth, the uh, differential exudation with depth. 
Um, and the transformative processes are those associated with uh, chemical reactivity. Uh, those are respiration, decomposition, weathering. And it just so happens that uh, the translational properties are, are and processes are handled really well by ecohydrologic models, such as root. Uh, and the transformative prop, uh, properties and processes are handled really well by uh, reactive transport models, uh, like crunch flow. And so what we've been working on recently uh, is we've been developing crunch root, which is the coupling of these two models, taking advantage of the um, physical um, um, spatial heterogeneity built into the, this ecosystem framework uh, from the root side with uh, and, and, and describing the transformation and uh, transport of active root zone carbon and nutrients using um, stoichiometrically balanced uh, uh, equations to describe that chemical reactivity. So this is a, an exciting um, uh, new development that I think can can address some some new uh, new exciting research questions like those that, uh, with rock respiration that um, Jenny was talking about. But uh, with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I don't know, Jenny, would you like to say anything to wrap up? Or oh, I, I think you did a great job, Susanna. I'm glad you got a chance to show a lot of the, the root model development. So great job. <laughs> OK, well, th thank you, everybody. Thank you for your attention. And uh, if we have any questions now, I think we can uh, answer some questions. So Susanna and, and um, Jenny, thank you so much. I'm Mary Power. I'm actually an aquatic food web ecologist, um, but I, I find your work really fascinating. And I have, I have something in my mind because I'm writing up a paper for a CRISPR gene editing conference. I'm not a gene editor, but they wanted an environmental perspective on stuff. So I have t uh, questions about what would happen if traits changed underground. And, one is um, the amount of carbon or suberin actually that roots manufacture and store. There's a project at the Salk Institute in San Diego, Joanne Chorley, you may know about it. She's engineering crop plants to have much thicker cortices, I guess, of cork or suberin in their roots as a way to make crops store more carbon. And I wondered how you thought that might influence their exudate mediated interactions yeah uh, so how uh, how it would specifically uh, affect root exudation would would depend first of all on, on species because those uh, the, the plant species because their rates of exudation and what they exude uh, depend uh, varies widely depending on what plant you're looking at mm -hmm. um, also you we have to consider that uh, plants and and I'm assuming this is part of the the idea of engineering these crops is that they have to there has to be some decision on what carbon to keep above ground what to send below ground how much of that photosynthate should be used to uh, grow the below ground so um, uh, there's there's that question as well but uh, certainly right now the way that we've parameterized root is uh, that the exudation is dependent on uh, root biomass because you do need some some exudates come from the uh, root tip and some are, are are sloughed off from the from the, the length of the root but that if that quantity changes I would expect root exudation to change um, now storing more carbon below ground that that also changes the the uh, the balance of, in, in nutrient cycling that we see. So that could have an effect on uh, the microbes in the soil and uh, perhaps the, that would trigger less of a certain type of exudate. So it's, it's very variable, but um, for something like glucose, for one of those essential ones that is sort of just sloughed off constantly from the root, I would expect there to be uh, a, a proportional response. 
do you think it would be a reduction or well, is it too hard to say i guess it, well, that, that's what I'm saying. i think it depends on the root exudate yeah. got it got yeah. it may i ask one more question about exudates as a as an aquatic ecologist i picked up on your flavonoids and their ability to depress nitrification yes so i'm wondering if if the um, plant or its environment caused more flavonoids to be released to soils, would that um, reduce the loss of nitrates to water, surface waters? Absolutely. I think that that's something that, uh, that, that is uh, expected. And I, I think that that's an avenue that this type of modeling can help inform pl uh, plant breeding practices or, or uh, uh, ag and bioengineering for, for more sustainable crops. That's absolutely a, an, an avenue. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. We have any other questions? Feel free to raise your hand and I'll unmute you. Neil? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, good. This is for Jenny. Um, hey, Jenny. Um, Hi. In your soil profiles of the CO2 and the oxygen, it looked to me like they were offset, the peaks were offset by a meter or two. Was that, it looked like the O2 was peaking slightly above the CO2. Was that oh, in my imagination or is that real? That, no, that's, that's, a great, that's a great point. So let's see, let me, let me squint really hard at these things. It's a little bit tough because um, the, so what I've got plotted on there, I don't know if you can still see it, but it's, um, Susanna, can you flip back? It's on slide 45. Oh, okay. Okay. Sorry. sorry. Thank you. I'm sorry. Um, so what you're looking at is an entire uh, uh, year. And so, for example, when you're looking at those yellow, yellow colors, that's when it's really dry and the pores are wide open. And in that case, if you look at the oxygen profile, you can see it's almost vertical if you, if you just kind of blur your eyes. And in other words, there's so much open pore space for gas diffusion that, that the atmospheric O2 is getting way down deep into that system, which is really neat. And, and when that happens, if you look over at the CO2, you can see that there's a lot of CO2 getting generated when there's a lot of O2 available. And I would say that that peak is somewhere around, I don't know, what do you want to call that, seven and a half? Um, if you go back to blue, you can see that oxygen has a hard time getting down into the subsurface when those pores are wet, right? Because it's just yeah. that the effective diffusivity is much lower. Um, and so there you can see that the minima of the oxygen is shallower. And if you were to unpack the yellow points off of the blue points in the CO2, you would see something similar. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Cool. Thanks. Awesome. Any other questions? No? Well, thank you, Suzanne and Jennifer. That was a great talk. Oh, Aaron, go for it. Okay. We can hear you. Oh, maybe you muted. Yeah. Sorry, I've never done it like this. Um, That's okay. I guess this is Jen. Um, it's on the same uh, graph because you know I know that there th these these profiles are have been uh, collected in a bunch of places, but the one I'm familiar with is in the Calhoun CZO, um, and um, there there's been like a and may, maybe you have addressed this and I might have I'm thinking back whether you had this on a previous slide, um, but you know there's also could be time scale. Uh, you know, the residence time of that CO2 uh, was one of the explanations that, that had been floated for in the Calhoun CZO for why we see this build up at depth. Um, and I wonder, I guess you have that, you, you can, you have maybe isotopic measurements or you have something here that um, allows you to um, look at the time scale that that CO2 is being generated. Of course, it's fluctuating with the year, so maybe that doesn't necessarily uh, or 
retain. But I just wonder if you have looked at other systems that might um, have similar profiles. And is this something that we probably expect a depth uh, dependency that's based on the type of vegetation or based on the, um, the type of uh, porosity, for instance, of the, of the system or the climate? What, what is your thought? On that. Yeah, thank you for that. It's it's a big question, right? So um, we got really excited when we first got these profiles and started looking around for other examples and uh, landed on that Sanchez Caliente paper first and we're playing around a lot with ARQ, which is basically a metric for whether or not the gradient in the oxygen balances the gradient in the CO2 so that oxygen consumption equals CO2 generation. Um, and we were getting pretty reasonable matches, but it looked like we were missing some. And we've been able to close that gap through solubility calculations, um, just using speciation models in terms of the amount of CO2 that must be getting dissolved into the fluid phase, and therefore is nominally driving enhanced uh, reactivity. So with those factors in mind, we can kind of close this as a, I guess I would say a short term cycle. Um, in other words, when you add up all of the different gradients and account for solubilization, you get back to the numbers that you're looking for. And I, I should also mention that this is all wonderful work that um, a graduate student, Allison Toon, has been doing at UT Austin with Daniela Rempe and also working with us up here at Illinois. So um, she's the expert. Um, but we haven't come to a, an observation yet in this data set that implies longer residence times for the CO2. As I mentioned previously, we do have radiocarbon and delta 13C, which support that this is quite modern. And at least in terms of the way the models are functioning right now, if I turned off that production, that CO2 would be gone, like quickly. Um, so that's the best that I can say for now. Um, but you know, I think Danielle is leading the charge on a bunch of new proposals where we're, really, we're excited to go kind of storming across the country looking for different places where this happens and different ways that it functions. So hopefully we'll have an answer for you. So and then is that higher CO2 than driving the, do you connect that to the weathering rates? Oh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't make that clearer, but when I showed you that massive discrepancy in the solute concentrations, that entire gap gets closed when we put this CO2 production into the model. It has to be there. If it's not there, you can't get the weathering that we're measuring. Okay, thanks, Jenny. Yeah. Uh, we had a question about what caused the increase of O2 after 10 meters. <laughs> we need to get off this slide. Uh <laughs> Uh, okay, I, I, I'm going to kind of loop back around and lean on Aaron a little bit because I think this isn't, as I've been talking to people, this originally really bothered me. And it, apparently it isn't the only place where this is seen, where oxygen comes down to a minima and then sort of looks like it recovers with deeper depth into the subsurface. In some places it's been suggested to occur as a result of oxygen that's coming off of the water table. Um, I haven't found anything that I can quite get my own mind to be settled on. So I, I'm going to leave that a little bit open, but I see what you're saying. <laughs> well, with that, we'll stop bombarding Jennifer with questions about the slide. <laughs> and we'll end the talk here. Thanks again to our speakers. Uh, join us June 10th for Dan Richter's talk, um, the Calhoun CZO. Thanks again, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you.